All right, everyone. Oh, am I here? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this week's uh, UCLIC Research Seminar. So we're very lucky to have Piotr Mirowski from DeepMind today, and he's going to be talking to us about using AI in live theater performance. So over to you. Thank you so much, Nancy. And uh, I would like to thank uh, so much uh, uh, Duncan. I would like to thank Jeremy for the invitation. Uh, it's really an honor to be here at the Interaction Center. This talk about designing artificial intelligence tools for live improvised theater performance. And as you can see, there are two different affiliations uh, under my name. One is a theater company called Improbotics, and the second one is my day job at Google DeepMind. But actually, we are going to hear a little bit about that later in the talk, which is all about the co-creative process with AI. So maybe as a very introduction, before I even go into the process of co-creation, I would like to say a few words about the tools that you can use, specific tools for art, uh, artists. So recently, uh, we have witnessed quite a lot of developments uh, in, and does this video play? It doesn't play. Um, but we have seen quite a lot of uh, developments uh, in the tools of generative AI that can be used by artists. Uh, for instance, Kendrick Lamar uh, can be seen transforming into figures resembling Will Smith, OJ Simpson, Kanye West, and others uh, using deepfake technology uh, in already a one-year-old uh, music video. ChatGPT being used to generate, to help a writer generate the script of a South Park episode. Or uh, Paul McCartney discussing about how he used AI with a team of researchers to create a final Beatles song. Uh, we were able to take John's voice, John Lennon's voice, and get it pure through this AI. Um, director Paul Trillo, in the video that doesn't play, but the video is really interesting to watch, thank you for not answering, um, has been using Stable Diffusion and Runway ML to create a very dreamy, uh, like a nightmarish sometimes, short film. And so, yes, I'm confident that many more co-creative applications for AI will come in the years to, to come, and uh, they will not be limited to the generation of text or audio mixing and mastering, but, um, to many more domains uh, in the uh, in performance. Uh, and I think that generative AI can assist in the development and ideation from concept art to script writing and many areas of production. But of course, there are various ethical considerations that we need to take into account, and we're going to go through them. So many of those tools for creativity are available today. And they're available either in an open source way or in a licensed way. And those tools help us reduce barriers. They allow sharing, remixing, streamlining the creative process and fostering creative exchange. These tools are quite capable, but they come of course with serious concerns about privacy and just copyright infringement uh, uh, to say the least. And so here I have some examples. Um, I think uh, recently released AI Test Kitchen Music uh, LM, uh, which can be used to generate um, generic music as a background. Uh, Dream Studio, um, Dream Screen uh, is going to be released for creators on uh, YouTube Shorts. Text effects that can uh, help you write, find synonyms, paraphrases for your work. And this giant table here with all the tools that have been perfected uh, and released recently, like including Pika Labs uh, version 1.0 released literally yesterday. Um, and I've been using some of those tools in my own practice uh, in theater. Uh, I can try to play this video and it is playing. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> we went back to, I have to restart it. So this is work done by some colleagues of mine at Google DeepMind um, who basically have partnered with musicians to test a tool that can help them in the creation process. And I think we can see here how from a simple humming by the artist, they managed to create multiple tracks uh, and use this as a form of exploration uh, for, uh, for the artists who basically wanted to try very quickly some ideas. 
Um, so those tools are being released on a very in a very controlled way to uh, to, to to artists uh, to make sure that um, they are used in the proper way. Um, but I would like to make this talk a little bit more personal and maybe uh, say a bit more about me and how I came myself to, to work in all those fields. So I did my PhD in computer science at New York University, NYU. Uh, that was between 2005 and 2010. Uh, my PhD advisor was Professor Yann Lequin, uh, who at the time still had a lot of time to, for his students. Uh, and we were basically working on the uh, on trying to make neural networks uh, popular again. Uh, I think when I was trying to publish papers, I had to avoid using the word neural networks. Uh, that's something like anomalized probability, anomalized generative models or probabilistic models. Instead, um, and so in the eleven years, twelve years since my graduation, I've been working as a research scientist in various. Uh, research, uh, research labs starting at Bell Labs. I worked for one year at Microsoft Bing and for the last past nine years at uh, Google DeepMind. Uh, this is some of my work from five years ago on learning, using reinforcer learning to learn to navigate in cities without a map. Uh, and the idea was to train an agent uh, to basically make, uh, to train the policy of an agent to navigate in a completely unseen environment uh, just using visual information. Uh, also, a few years ago, uh, two years ago, actually, we published in Nature this paper on now casting, which was weather forecasting at a very short time horizon of about two hours, but an extremely high resolution of a kilometer. We work with the Met Office, who provided us with radar data from 16 radars across the UK, and uh, we essentially improved upon their existing model. And the interesting aspect of the research is that we evaluated it with, in an HCI context with meteorologists uh, by asking them how useful it is for them to then make their, uh, release their, uh, their forecasts. Um, and we use generative models, GANs, generative adversarial networks in an interesting way where we would sample continuously different outcomes from uh, different realizations, uh, different generations of the GAN in order to estimate the uncertainty at every pixel. And that uncertainty is, is extremely useful, of course, for weather forecasts. But at the same time, uh, I, during the night uh, for the past 20 years, I've been doing theater. I actually went part-time uh, to nights and weekends to the London School of Dramatic Arts uh, to get a diploma in, in acting. Uh, and did some productions. And I've been doing improv, improv comedy, improv theater for the past 20 something years, just as, essentially at the same time as, as when I started doing um, research uh, in, in AI. Uh, and the it's a slightly different uh, part of my brain that, that is used, but I try to take some of the lessons from working with real world data in engineering contexts back to theater and create something new. Um, so I realized that live performance can really become a test bed for co-creating with artists in the same way as we try and experiment in a, theater, in a, um, in a lab setting. So we, I've set up this theater lab uh, I create, I'm a co-founder and director of theater company in Probotics, and uh, we've been looking at various ways of making theater with AI, of course, uh, taking into account responsibility. Um, and most important is that we focus on live human performance uh, because it's a way of centering the, the human performer. Uh, generative AI only is a tool uh, that enables better human performance. So people uh, come for the robot, but they stay for the human at the end of the day. So these are my personal thoughts about having AI as a partner and the process of co-creating with AI, uh, working with this very strange partner. And uh, I said, on try to explore, um, investigate four different areas. The first one was balancing and predictability and predictability and surprise. The second one, co-creation, uh, so treating the AI as a as a creative partner. Uh, the third one was exploration, so really seeing where this can take us to. 
Um, and the last one, trying to make actually make it co coherent because it tends to generate lots of garbage. Um, and there were four different outcomes that came out of it. The first one, well, learning how to embrace the imperfections and limitations of AI. The second, use it as a creative challenge for performance training. The third one, interdisciplinarity. How can we communicate science at a comedy club at midnight? And the last one, uh, the ethics and participatory design with artists. So let's start with the first desideratum. Uh, we want a good creative partner. So the powerful AI tools should work for the human creator by being both reliable and surprising. And I will continue with my origin story. A few years ago, I used to work at Microsoft Bing uh, on the second most popular search engine. <laughs> you wake up in the morning and you know that your objective is uh, to make Bing better. Um, and I was working on uh, query autocompletion, basically predictive text. And predictive text, uh, as you know, is a statistical model uh, of what you're going to type based on what you used to type in the past, but also the context, maybe time of the day, uh, your geographical location to make it more specific. So we have here the example starting with I, and as you keep adding letters, it becomes more and more specific and it goes to improvisation. Um, so autocomplete and auto-suggest, all those tools, predictive text, all essentially trying to be obvious to do the most obvious thing, to try to guess uh, what you're going to type based on uh, the context of the, the search. And so, as I said, in parallel, to my, in parallel to my career in science, I've been doing lots of theater, um, doing fringe productions. And one thing I really love in theater is improvisation. What I love in improvisation is the idea of vulnerability. The fact that you're trying to do theater and comedy without a script. That means that you need to, well, learn a whole new uh, vocabulary of theatrical performance and uh, understanding with your fellow stage partners and with the audience to make it work. So here are some examples of improv shows that you can see in London. You can see the showstoppers sometimes on the West End. Uh, in the same theater that I think used to do um, uh, the Michael Jackson thriller. So once a month or once every other month, they have a 1,000 seat theater for a two hour improvised musical made up entirely on the spot with uh, suggestions of genres, uh, specific artists, and of course a made up title. Every time it's different and it seems magical uh, with the magic comes from the humans who really know how to do it. If you want to audition to be, to be with showstoppers, you'd better know 250 musicals by heart. Yes, it's a high criterion. You can also see uh, ostentatious uh, improvised Jane Austen musical, uh, musical um, play, a long lost book by Jane Austen. Uh, a friend of mine is a member of Castle of Improbotics, is performing in Netflix uh, a musical um, film. Uh, you may have heard about Whose Line Is It Anyway? and Colin Mochrin, all the, the all-star casts of doing short form improv comedy. And I recently uh, was delighted to, to see productions by Degree of Error from Bristol, uh, Murder She Didn't Write, and totally improvised uh, murder mystery where they have no idea at the beginning who killed who, anyone. They, they're going to discover it as the improv progresses. So um, improvisation in jazz, and on the theater stage is really, first of all, as I mentioned about practice. So you need to know your stuff in order to be able to feel comfortable to go on stage and to, uh, to use it. But part of that knowing your stuff consists of just being able to acknowledge your lived experience and using your lived experience and your culture on stage. Um, performers need to adapt to the changing context of the scene and to listen to and to collaborate with other performers according to the famous yes and principle. Uh, that involves basically listening to whatever is in front of you. Um, that means that you don't need to try to be clever. Don't be clever. Don't be in your head. Don't think. But the, the strangest advice I've ever been given by theater directors is stop being in your head. Stop thinking. Uh, what you want to do is in front of you, in the eyes of your stage partner, in the way they have moved their lips, uh, the way they touch their hair, uh, the, the seem worried, 
what does it mean? What can you keep it forever? And how can you make it worse? Make it worse, exaggerate everything and keep always going in the, uh, in the past of least resistance towards building a new narrative. And this happens magically by having two people meeting on stage, each of them saying the most obvious thing according to their own mental model, but then the collision creates something interesting and new and unexpected. And they need to acknowledge that and go in, in that direction. Uh, and yes, uh, Keith Johnston and Viola Spolin, all those two theater practitioners who've been uh, really advocating for that vulnerability on stage. So for me, the most obvious thing was to take AI and improv and stick them together. It's obvious, right? I do two things, they have to work together. So um, this is me in uh, early 2017, uh, and I started working this in late 2015. Improv comedy with a robot. So here you can see Alex, artificial language experiment. It's, a, um, it's essentially a whole system that can be visualized and impersonated by this little toy robot uh, made by easy robots uh, that moves uh, every time a line is generated with some, using some st stereotypical movements, which I programmed. Then there is speech recognition with my microphone, uh, which is sent to a speech recognition engine uh, that transcribes it and sends it straight away to a chatbot. So at that time in 2016, I programmed it from scratch uh, based on char RNN, a recurrent neural network. Uh, and I trained it on the data from open subtitles, 100,000 films. Um, and that dialogue, uh, that, that, uh, that data set was um, publicly available and it was user, user contributed. So I was able to use it for, for that purpose. And it corresponded the most to this idea of staging something, because as performers, we also work with our ideas of script of what we get from our cultural baggage, including films and plays. So using using uh, a theater, uh, using film to inform a chatbot for theater seemed an obvious thing to do. And anytime the chatbot comes up with an answer, which might be 10 seconds later, or maybe five seconds later, it says it. So like, as you can imagine, there's a lot of waiting time and have to fill that time. In addition to the fact that the answers may just not make sense. But I was trying to get that chatbot to tell interesting and comedic stories, which of course was a hilariously impossible task. The AI at the time would keep generating absurd nonsense. The language model would hallucinate, a word we keep using today, overusing actually, because it's not sentient. And my task became to embrace the imperfections and limitations of AI. So what I had essentially built was a glorified AI version of an exquisite corpse, that game of the surrealists. Uh, and of course, I, would not, I was not the only one to notice this. Uh, there had been a breakthrough in 2015 uh, in language models, uh, with Chao RNN being made available and people managing to train it on large corpora of text. And that has prompted theater and movie directors to start to try using them to write lyrics uh, for a song, uh, like in the musical uh, Beyond the Fence, produced on the West End, uh, work done by Simon Colton and uh, Benjamin Till and Evan Taylor, a, a large, um, la large cast of creatives. Uh, or uh, Sandspring, uh, released in, again in 2016, where the whole script was generated by an RNN. In both cases, it didn't make sense. It's the director, it's the actors who gave it meaning. Uh, and they had a lot of work to do to get meaning. Um, so they embedded meaning and subtext. And then models, of course, kept improving. Uh, GBT2 was released. We all remember how it would bring down the uh, civilization, uh, according to some uh, press articles. Uh, and then GBT3 came, and they were used, for instance, by uh, my friend, co uh, partner, uh, Gunther Lösel, in, in his play Beyond Human, um, or by um, a theater in Prague who celebrated the centenary uh, of the play Or You Are by Karl Czapek, where the word robot originated uh, by uh, co-writing a play with GPT-2. And then GPT-3 was used for creating short films like by Cameron T. AI, 
or even staging the play AI at the Young Vic in 2021 uh, by Jennifer Tang and Nina Siegel. So they all embraced the limitation of AI. But the second and probably the most important aspect uh, of working with AI as a tool is co-creation. And so here I would like to acknowledge uh, Corey Mathewson, whom I met in the process of developing Alex, my stage partner. So Corey is a like-minded researcher in AI and robotics, living in Canada. At the time he was doing a PhD in robotics and he was also doing improv comedy. And he did a show uh, in Edmonton in 2016. So he wrote about this, he blogged about it. I wrote him an email, very long email apparently, uh, according to him. Uh, thousands of words uh, and immediately we connected he took a plane he traveled to London uh, and we schemed we plotted uh, what to do next so we started working together remotely we became friends so his motivation is that good improvisers look good on stage but the best improvisers make the other person look good on stage and that is this additional aspect of co-creation improv which is it's not about yourself it's about the show so Corey wanted to apply that principle to AI, to make AI look good, make him look good on stage, and also to make the AI look good on stage, which of course was a hilariously impossible task. Um, and we started performing together in 2017 remotely. Um, we did this transatlantic artificial intelligence improv comedy show simultaneously in two theaters in London and in Portland, Oregon, eight time zones apart, so we thought, um, with two AIs, two robots, uh, and two live audiences. Until, and until the day before the show, we realized that there is a week in the year where the daylight saving time is not aligned <laughs> between North America and Europe. Can you move the show by one hour? No, I can't, I can't either. Well, I have a wedding rehearsal uh, scheduled half an hour into the slot. Uh, oh, okay. Well, we're going to make it work anyway. So we started the show with somewhat low expectations, I guess, that the show had to go on. Of course, he's, he had to move his show uh, one hour earlier, uh, one hour later, actually. And um, there was no audience uh, because of that. So, it, yeah, the robot literally crushed and burned. It fell on the stage, there was smoke coming out of a robot, of a servo. And then we had 15 minutes to get in because a previous troop overran in London. So that means we didn't have time to adjust microphone levels. So speech recognition didn't work. So the chatbot was not responding. And uh, that's the day when the photographer came. Um, so you can see me sweating. But also the reviewer came. She wrote two stars. Chaotic, never work with robots. Well, good thing we didn't listen. So first, we fixed the many technical processes in our show. For a second, we used that opportunity to, as a, essentially as a creative challenge, to redesign the show around human AI co-creation, reframing it as a form of theater performance training instead of just being a demonstration of technology. And despite those bad reviews, we persisted and recreated in 2018 a theater company called Improbotics, where I mentioned earlier, uh, with other actors. So we noticed that it's the role of a human actor to give meaning to absurd AI text. So in our theatrical troupe, we decided to perform a live Turing test. It's no longer robots, but human actors who deliver the AI-generated lines, which they receive via a headpiece, um, and they add to those lines delivery, so it means timing, emotion, and subtext. Interpretation, basically. Theatrical interpretation. And in some cases, the audience needs to tell apart who is the AI and who is the robot. Uh, sorry. Gosh. The singularity has happened. Um, who is the AI and who is the human? Um, but of course, we do it in a very uh, ethical way, so we tell ahead of time we're going to run a Turing test. You don't try to induce the audience into error. And so to increase the quality of the AI-generated dialogue, the human controllers manually curate the lines uh, produced by the chatbot. 
So that approach allows us to mitigate the many biases in language models, obviously, uh, removing offensive context. So we may have some automatic curation by prospective API to literally just replace sentences we don't want to, to hear, or just delete sentences with words that just have no place on the stage. Um, yes. And, but we also sometimes realize that some sentences may be toxic because of a of previous context. And that only, that's only a human who can detect that. Um, and I personally believe that nothing can possibly replace uh, manual curation. And automatic curation is, is a bit uh, of a very difficult, uh, impossible task in itself. So we also have been using AI as a tool for participatory design. So going back to the play AI by Jennifer Tang and uh, Ina Siegel at the Young Vic, uh, that was an interesting example where they staged a collaborative process uh, involving uh, the dramaturg, dramaturge, the actors and the audience at the same time interacting and discussing how to stage it. And we had adopted a similar collaborative approach in our theater company because we have been running workshops with, uh, with our troupe, but also with other theater troops, with, uh, with people from all um, um, domains of expertise within theater. We led workshops with professional actors who were playing with the chatbots, inviting them to deliver, curate, and reflect on the outputs of AI, on its creative capabilities and its limitations. And uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we collaborated with other groups to uh, bring chatbots on stage and, and, and study essentially how they approach our problem. So it's all done in a logic of human machine collaboration and not at all a logic of replacement. It's really a logic for augmentation as much as possible. So as we persisted in our initial explorations, um, we went from being a human machine duet featuring physical robots to become a company of several dozens of actors. And from improvisation, we let actors with non-technical backgrounds to explore possibilities and constraints of AI system, develop an intuition about them. And we have been publishing our work at various human computer interaction venues uh, or computational creativity venues. And so I left this whole list of papers uh, here um, as a link, and you can just find them on, uh, on my Google Scholar. Um, the other aspect of this is that at the end of the day, we wanted to make a good show for the audience. That was our first driver. And so we managed to go from a two-star chaotic never work with robots review to better reviews over time, uh, with a score increasing over time. And uh, I would like to propose a new metric for AI co-creative systems, which is the number of stars in a film or theater review. And obviously, because this is AI, you have noticed the red line, an exponential. Sorry, Silicon Valley joke. Um, in addition to treating the AI tool as a way to impinge upon or to improve theatrical uh, performance, we also explore the various co-creative modalities that are enabled by those AI tools. So we explored, for instance, the idea of bringing translation, live translation on stage. So you, uh, I just had a wonderful chat with Ben about uh, translating theater. And normally what happens is that the script is given ahead of time uh, for the sub to get subtitles. Well, we use Google speech recognition and or more recently Whisper uh, AI to get those live subtitles. Uh, and we worked around this to create a new show where actors speaking different languages were performing together on the same stage. And maybe they would not understand the words, but they would try to guess them based on physicality and context and all this nonverbal communication, while the audience would be shown the actual translation. And so the hilarity would come from all the multiple ways to misunderstand each other, which is fantastic. Um, and as a further axis of, of investigation, we also built tools for human computer interaction including vision-based uh, tele-immersive tools for performance and rehearsal. So when the pandemic started, we were all at home and uh, regretting the good time of being on stage together. 
And Boyd Branch, um, who was doing his PhD at the University of Kent, and who's currently a lecturer at Coventry and uh, a lead of a uh, digital media design and interaction lab, has been really working in the field of augmented reality and virtual reality for a long time. And he, uh, as a member of Infobotics, he basically built, and for his PhD, he built the virtual design, a virtual director, which is essentially using touch designer, a tool that allows us to beam our green screen, green screen videos from home. So each of us had a green screen, or just use the virtual green screen, which is not as, not as good. And he would receive those feeds via Zoom or via OBS, Studio, uh, sorry, OBS Ninja, that was the name of the tool. Um, so very fast transmission via um, fast protocols uh, of a live video stream. And he built this tool that enabled to live mix, place the actors as cutouts in a 3D space, add a foreground, add a background. So it could be, let's say, a video of Central Park, or it could even be like a 3D model in, uh, um, Unity or in um, Unreal Engine of some environment. And we would evolve in that space and we could, for instance, I don't know, for the next scene, two people appear in a bathtub and uh, we have to justify what happens. Um, or maybe driving a car. We explored that and uh, I actually, I forgot to put the second reference here, but we published this at Sikai on Telemers with Improv and he followed that study uh, with another study at Sikai last year about the effect of being collocated virtually upon the feeling of connection with the other person and what difference it makes uh, with respect to the Zoom fatigue. So yes, I think, uh, well, you can look at the most recent paper by Bob Branch. It will be specifically about this mirror uh, effect of teleimmersion or the Zoom fatigue. And so it's also in that context that we, in our most recent shows, uh, we started uh, to try to create comedic narratives alongside AA-based image generators. And so here we were looking both at the uh, how to make it work and also all the social, technical, and ethical aspects of this. And I'm going to actually talk about this now. But before I even go there, let me just show you the tech stack of our typical show uh, in uh, as, as of more, most recently. So we have a lot of chatbots running in parallel using various language models for redundancy to make sure that we always get some answer uh, for any line of dialogue. So we have ChatGPT 3.5, but also Palm, so it's text Bison, and Llama running locally on the laptop. We, we generate images using stable diffusion running locally uh, or on a web server or as an API call. Uh, I mentioned uh, speech recognition, so now we use Whisper, again, running locally on the laptop. Uh, we control the robot, we have touch designer because we need projections, text-to-speech, and of course, this extra FM radios and transmitters. And that happens in the context of a performance in a, well, in a comedy club. We have to make it happen. We're 15 minutes get in. Um, and our main problem is latency and timing obviously, because that's the crucial aspect of a, of a live performance. Uh, so one of the issues is just to, to make sure that it works. So I really try to condense everything into just one beefy MacBook, uh, 96 gigabytes. That's a godsend because you have so many machine learning models running there. It's better than having an, uh, an RTX graphics card and a separate laptop and a desktop. I tried that too. Um, having confidence monitors for the actors, having a tablet, that enables the actors to choose and curate in real time. And so of course that means writing lots of local host servers in Python running and communicating with everything, make it work. Um, projectors, USB mics, the easiest to set up, just plug and play, plays a mic on stage. Uh, given that we have typically 15 minutes before a show and that includes warming up and letting the audience in. And then we need to get the tech out as, as fast as possible before the next show. Um, so coming back to specifically the image generation. Well, since 2015, image generation has progressed quite a lot. Has progressed quite a lot. Uh, so it was initially an uncanny curiosity. Uh, it became a detailed reduction of reality, thanks to generative address network networks, 
uh, known mostly for artistic style transfer. Uh, and that gave rise to text-guided diffusion-based generators, which are trained on billions of caption images. And that allows to uh, have realistic image generation in seconds. And the impact of these algorithms went from being a niche exploration of a glitch aesthetic by a handful of visual artists like Memo Acton uh, to standard image editing tools by visual artists, as well as sometimes mainstream and commodified artistic ready-mades. And we decided to use these text image generators as tool in uh, our interaction. I'm going to skip the video. And our inspiration uh, comes from um, essentially PowerPoint karaoke or improvised TED Talks, uh, something that Corey Matheson himself was involved with. So in that context, the game is that the, the slides are generated or made ahead of time. Uh, by somebody who is not going, who's not the same person who's going to present it. So the presenter discovers the slides live. And we have to react to those slides uh, and to justify everything that is shown, irrespective of how absurd it is and how incongruous it may be. And make it happen as if it was exactly what they meant, meant to say. And so comedy derives from the wit of the actors who adapt to the suggestions while essentially keeping a coherent narrative. Okay, let's keep the multiverse arbitration. And so in the first version of our show, uh, when we are still during the pandemic uh, working remotely, uh, we are doing teleimmersive online performances. Um, we, we essentially used those image generators as pseudo art, abstract art generators. And then we projected on a virtual painter's easel uh, letting the improvisers and the audiences see the image as it was being generated, as if it was, as if it were actually made by the performer, and sometimes it will be revealed only at the end as a punchline, and there will be various games resulting from information asymmetry. Um, so, in order to make that work, in 2021, we relied on open source uh, code, uh, which you may have used, VQGAN uh, and Clip. Uh, there were lots of collabs, Google collabs circulating in early 21, where people were assembling various pre-trained models to make them work together to generate images. Uh, it, the first one was called Big Sleep. Uh, so it used generative adversarial networks, and that's the sort of images it would generate in about five minutes. Very abstract looking, uh, very, un very uncanny. Uh, but at least it somehow was related vaguely to some ideas within the text prompt. So because the generation would take five minutes, that forced us to develop specific games around the concept of painting. And we designed uh, improv scenes, especially specifically around the process. Like a painter, a painter in a studio meeting a couple uh, who wants a portrait to be paint, painted. Uh, the generated images would be revealed progressively. Uh, and then sometimes uh, result in uh, surprise. So with the technology developed, we started using vector quantized GANs, uh, still slow to generate, but at least uh, much faster. And the result would be, uh, sorry, not much faster, much more realistic somehow. Um, we started considering this as forms of abstract art, um, and we use that to generate caricatures highlighting the uncanny elements. And then came latent diffusion, which enabled to generate very fast images. We were able to generate the image in as little as five to 10 seconds. And so we devised new games to take advantage of that faster generation. Uh, for instance, allowing the prompter to react in real time to whatever happens on stage and to have this interaction, real live interaction with performance, riffing off on the scene. Uh, and the role of the curator became much more prominent because we, if we could generate many more images, we could also select from many more candidates and choose the most appropriate one and also discard anything that looked mm, strange and inappropriate given the audience. So you can see the uh, curator holding a tablet. And some examples of performances, I think here the prompt was sausages and we ended up with the king. Uh, it was an improvised pitch, I'm sorry. Um, and apologies, I'm French. 
Um, and um, this is, I guess, involving some celebrity cameos. Uh, we basically, the game we came up with was called Movie Pitch, where the uh, two directors try to pitch a film to uh, the producer and they discover uh, what it is actually about as they pitch it. So the format has been presented many times, uh, 52 times exactly, since um, the, uh, for the past three years. Um, and we were actually part of the uh, Edinburgh Fringe uh, run, uh, performance, uh, a whole month run. So um, maybe I can say a few words about interdisciplinarity at this point. So showing image generation on screen allows different modalities, uh, I mean, through different modalities, allows us to communicate different aspects of the algorithm and to demystify the image generation process. And that helps in turn to initiate a dialogue on the concerns about generative AI. So I just wanted to briefly come back to what I mentioned earlier about my own day job. So I was working on weather forecasting, as I mentioned that we used uh, the possibility of GANs to generate multiple images to actually be able to, to estimate uncertainty. And so I took that principle on stage. Um, so this is, these are examples of different realizations uh, to be able to estimate uncertainty for weather forecasts. So I took a principle on stage to show to the audience what happens for the same prompt and same condition. This is our uh, poster, which is made using stable diffusion and control net uh, in and dream booth. So basically we fine tune stable diffusion on our headshots. We do it on our on desktop and we can generate those synthetic images according to a specific prompt. And the different realizations of the same stable diffusion algorithm of the same pre-training, the same prompt can differ quite a lot while maintaining similar features like my eyes of my mustache, my goatee, and the fact that I normally wear uh, shirts that became part of my identity according to stable diffusion. Um, so in our shows, we're uh, showing that uh, the multiple realizations, we're also showing the iterative process to kind of illustrate the idea of gradient descent on stage. Uh, and we explicitly addressed uh, the issues of plagiarism, copyright infringement, um, and the fact that um, this can result in misappropriation of creative work and cannibalization of uh, creative economies, literally by making it part of our introduction. And we did that uh, at the, among others, most recently at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, uh, 3,600 sh unique shows, 60,000 performances over a month. The whole of Edinburgh is transformed into a giant theater, hundreds of venues, everything, every school, every hospital, every church is converted to a theater at this point. Uh, it's a giant party. And uh, yes, so we did a 26 day run every day at 6 p.m. Uh, I needed a holiday after that, um, but it was, it was exhilarating. So now finishing with uh, the idea of coherence and capability. So Curry and I, at this point, we're both working actually at DeepMind. Uh, Curry has been working there for a few years. And we realized that we could maybe bring some of those ideas to our day job. And specifically, we looked into the limitations of language models um, for uh, predicting next word. And so one of the problems that we observed is that they tended to generate inco inconsistent, incoherent texts. And to, uh, that, that's, that's something we noticed two years ago and we try to improve upon that. So we designed a system called Dramatron and we ended up writing about this at uh, Computer Human Interaction, co-writing screenplays and theater scripts with language models and evaluation by industry professionals. I think the biggest contribution was the fact that we did it in a participatory way by asking 15 industry professionals for feedback. And we did that uh, in summer 22, so before ChatGPT. Our system relied on prompt chaining. Um, so we would start from a log line that would generate different elements, including lists of characters, list of plot points, location descriptions. Um, so you probably have become used to that if you have used Langchain and all those um, GPT tools that allow you to 
take and generate something, take the output, and then feed it back and iterate on that. So our system was essentially based on this with some additional rewriting by the artist. And um, we looked at how to structure the storytelling. We uh, investigated uh, the various uh, story narrative structures from the Freitag pyramid to the uh, hero journey. Uh, of course, we paid attention to the fact that if this, all, all of those structures are typically Western, there are many different ways of telling a story. We designed a tool using a collab that we presented to artists and that's available today uh, if you want to use it, uh, that allows this interactive rewriting. And uh, as I mentioned, we had an evaluation where we asked the artists uh, in two hour sessions, the writers in two hour sessions to comment and to fill a survey after the, uh, uh, the session about the interaction and the capability of a tool to be a creativity support tool. And they had uh, relatively mixed uh, responses. They did enjoy um, the, uh, some of the aspects. We, um, so we queried for ownership, pride, ease of use, expressivity, helpfulness, collaboration, uniqueness, enjoyment, and surprise. Um, they note, uh, so they loved being surprised by some of those generations, um, but we noticed a difference when we segmented the uh, survey by the uh, field of specialization of the writers. Screenwriters who were used to writing in a writer's room and to interact with other writers were more willing to work with such a tool than playwrights who were more used to writing uh, alone in a non-linear way. Um, and so that's something that was very uh, apparent from our survey. And when we looked at the qualitative evaluation, uh, so we, based on the interviews during, uh, during the discussions, uh, the positive aspects that came up were inspiration, word building, because you generate multiple choices and you can essentially populate with ideas, uh, expand upon your original idea and populate the world on in which you're writing. Um, putting words on a page. Some writers were interested in ideas that would be very, uh, that only a machine could have. Um, but at the same time, everyone noticed that the work was very derivative uh, by definition, that it can't write a complete work and that it relied on a lot of predictable tropes. And that's of course something that now has become common knowledge after we have all used ChatGPT uh, extensively. So yes, AI will never write Casablanca, Wonderful Life, but it might do Netflix. No comments. Um, and we also evaluated it with one writer in extended sessions for 22 hours, where he wrote four scripts for a theater performance festival uh, that were basically script, scripts that were used to inform semi-improvised performances, where the actors would first uh, get uh, on the day of the performance, the script from a craft envelope, as long as the costume, uh, he was not very happy to have his robot costume here, uh, Lycra and etc. And they would have to basically read the script for the first half, half hour and then discard the script and go on from there and perform uh, after having essentially made own uh, the universe defined by the script. And um, this was evaluated among others, but again, by reviews. So before, and I think now is really time to finish the talk, before conducting our study, we had identified three relevant risks and ethical implications, and that's through work uh, led by Laura Weiniger, a colleague of ours. Bias and offensive language um, in the output, the automation of creative work res resulting in cannibalizing creative economies and reusing copyrighted data, knowingly or unknowingly. The all mitigation strategies, including scanning the output for uh, existing material and also just being very transparent about the origin of generated text. Uh, of course, our study was done before uh, ChatGPT, before the WGA strike. I'm quite happy about the resolution of the WGA strike because that essentially ended as a best possible world. It, they decided that uh, generative AI cannot be used against the writers, but they can use generative AI themselves if they want to, and they feel confident uh, in the outputs. 
And uh, we have been ourselves engaging, so it's back to improv uh, comedy, with the audiences via essentially human computer interaction surveys uh, asked to the audience uh, members after the show, uh, again, to really understand how they perceived AI and how we communicated about this. And we have a paper in submission at this point. And that was a great way for us to communicate about all those issues. Um, we also engaged a lot of the press, uh, of the press rather engaged with us because of the, uh, uh, of the fact that there was AI and comedy in the title of our show. Uh, and that was a great way for us to really start addressing all the questions about copyright, misappropriation, destructive impact of, on creative economies, representational biases. I believe that effectively the way for us to craft uh, the future for generative AI is to do it in a participatory way, really engaging with every community that is being impacted, understand their needs and how to make it work for them. And as I guess as a final word, I would say that uh, what I said actually really at the beginning, which is our performance is at the end of the day about centering the human performer on stage. So thank you so much. This is the list of all my collaborators uh, from Improbotics, the leaders of the various teams and groups we have and uh, from our paper. And I'm here to answer questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Is there any questions? Hi, um, Enrico Costanza. Um, thank you so much. Very inspiring. Um, lots of food for thought. My question goes beyond the talk. Um, I was curious about why you keep the day and night job separate. And if in a, in a sort of chat GPT prompt style, <laughs> can you try to answer this thinking about the fact that many in the audience are students who may be um, thinking about their next steps in, in the career? And, and, and what, what's your, uh, how, how did your experience get into that? Yeah, so actually I am, uh, so I started trying to bridge some of those two fields. Uh, so I, we started with a paper we wrote um, last year on um, participatory AI with, with writers and evaluation of language models in that very specific creative context. And I am interested indeed in uh, both participation and um, creative uses of generative media um, in my day job. So I'll, I'll slowly start looking into that. And uh, I think that it's um, probably um, a very important research topic at this point. Uh, it's super easy to justify it. It's simply because it corresponds to the use cases uh, that we have found. Um, so your second question was, uh, yes, but yeah, so I hope, I hope there will be many more essentially uh, research in HCI uh, going, moving forward. And that's uh, including even at the biggest corporations simply because we need to understand essentially how to engage uh, with the users when they use the uh, those algorithms, and it's uh, we can't just solve things by designing better algorithms. We need to design better interfaces. Sorry, I have to follow up. Um, do you feel that you need to have? Um, do you feel that you need to have, like, one role that is purely technical, to be able to then create a dialogue, like? Um, you didn't say a lot about your, your deep mind role, but from the little that you said, it sounds like it's sort of a more classic or canonical AI ML kind of work and, and, and following from you, what I can imagine your PhD was, was, was about. Um, do you feel that you need to have like two characters to have this dialogue or is it more practical issues of like, um, lifestyle choices and, um, sort of disposable income. Yes, um, so I I hope um, that the um, brutal realization that happens uh, slowly, that it's increasingly more uh, likely and possible to, to work in technology with not a pure technical background. Uh, 
I see that already a lot in AI ethics, where people with uh, humanities uh, background who have done the PhD in politics, um, economic policies, have been working and shaping and engaging with um, uh, yeah, with, with researchers working on algorithms. The, uh, so to, there are some uh, pure creators um, or pure artistically uh, educated people working in those companies uh, slowly, I would say, yes. The, um, probably the, the, the problem is that we still have a mantra of scaling things up. And scaling things up requires basically just engineering on how to run those bigger and bigger models or more on more GPUs or more uh, tensor processing units. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a sort of a, a, a selection that, uh, that operates at this point. Um, but, the, but this is only part of, uh, of a development happen, happening there. I don't, did I really answer your question or were they evading? Um, the, yeah, no, I, I think, I think, I think I'm not, I'm not managing to, to, to um, express my question in a way that is, uh, that, it, that it makes sense. I, I, I'll try to think about, but I don't want to sort of like make this yeah. a, a dialogue just between the two of us. Maybe we can take it off, offline. Thanks. I mean, I would say that I personally really believe in interdisciplinarity. Now the question, I, I can't speak for everyone else in, in tech. Um, and I hope that they start realizing it's necessary to be inter interdisciplinary. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, so I'm going to ask one of those questions that is very sort of, we all see in the media these days, right? Yeah. So a lot of the, the, the comedic value and the theatrical value of some of the projects that you explored uh, comes from the gap between what the AI models say and what we interpret or what we think is funny in the gaps or how they, as, a, as these models get better, where do you think this sort of co-creation and collaboration relationship between the human AI is going to lie? Yes, so I think that the um, initially, I mentioned very briefly glitch aesthetic, and so that's Mario Klingemann, uh, Anna Riddler, uh, Memo Acton, uh, all those artists who basically uh, find something that is weird and wonky and then go make it worse. <laughs> they, they go in that direction. Um, and uh, Luba Elliott, who has curated recently uh, at UNIT London um, a, an exhibition featuring AI artists, artists working with AI, um, I had a discussion with her and she said it's now difficult kind of to uh, curate uh, more recent work because it's closer to photography in a way. Uh, and sometimes the process is not obvious. But I would say that maybe it's because what we've seen so far is only just the equivalent of selfies, like using photography to take selfies, which is not interesting per se. Uh, and we still, uh, on some people have started using, as photographers did, uh, it, yeah, um, in, in a creative way to, to find a new vocabulary. I think photography really took time. I, I saw this exhibition on Steiglitz and uh, that, that was like in the 1920s or something like that. So it much, uh, much after the photography. So I see a big use case uh, of um, AI as providing a draft, a very quick draft. And so here it's really the, the scale that is helpful. It doesn't matter that every single one of them is mediocre. Maybe one, some of them are less mediocre than others, but it's the fact that it provides a very quick feedback very quickly that can perhaps help in the ideation process. So I see it, I, I'm, at least that's how I, I view it. Maybe some people want to take the output of AI as the final output, yes. Um, but I see it as an ideation, a rapid ideation process, a rapid ideation tool inside an existing artistic process. Okay, so I think because of the time, we're gonna have to wrap up here, but Piotr is still gonna be around for 
chatting afterwards until about five so um so i know some people have to head off elsewhere but yeah can we have another round of applause please thank you for great thank you. <laughs> Thank you.